All righty. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Wolf SSL Live webinar on getting started with Wolf TPM with uh, Wolf SSL engineer David Garski. My name is Kajal Sapkota, and I will be moderating this webinar. All attendees will be in listen only mode. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A box or raise your hand to be unmuted if you would like to ask the question live as we do host a Q&A session following the presentation. Um, this webinar will also be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel shortly after the presentation. And uh, we also provide slide decks to anyone who requests for them through our email. Just email us at um, info at wolfssl.com and we'll be happy to send that over to you. Um, I invite everyone to follow us on Twitter at WolfSSL, as well as all of our other socials. And if you have any other questions regarding WolfSSL or anything like that, please feel free to email us at facts at wolfssl.com. And now I'd like to give a brief company overview before we move to the technical presentation. Wolf SSL was founded in 2004 by Todd Auska and Larry Stefanik when they realized there wasn't an open source dual licensed embedded SSL library available. Open SSL existed at the time, but there was a demand for an alternative that was easily portable, smaller, faster, available under a clear commercial license, was equipped with a clean and modern API and offered commercial style developer support. Wolf SSL was born into this market need with an open SSL compatibility layer. Today, Wolf SSL secures over 2 billion connections. We have more than 1,000 OEM customers and dozens of resellers. Wolf SSL is made up of almost 40 dedicated employees in 2020, most of which are engineers. This progress is, of course, supported by a strong partner network that we're very proud of, which includes ISRG. ST Micro and Curl, for example. Since the beginning, our engineering team has developed several embedded security products, including WolfCrypt with TO178 support, FIPS certification, and a FIPS ready offering, MQTT up to the version 5 specification, SSH v2, TPM 2.0, a secure boat bootloader known as WolfBoot as well as Java wrappers and JSSC support and commercial support for curl. All of these offerings are accompanied by thorough maintenance and support plans up to the 24 seven level. We also offer full service consulting. And now I'm gonna hand it over to David for the presentation. Thanks, Kajal. Um, let's see, let's get started here. So we're gonna talk about Wolf TPM in, uh, today. Uh, there's a couple ways you can get the software. One is from the website as a download, and the other is on our GitHub page. Um, and that is licensed as GPLv2. We also offer a commercial license for this library. It can be built completely standalone. Um, if you're using parameter encryption, you would need to also have Wolf, Wolf SSL, which includes WolfScript installed. Um, so we offer professional support from engineers like me. Um, and consulting services to help for integration and new features. So we're going to give a quick overview. Um, TPM mo modules are typically found in x86 type systems, servers and desktops. Um, there seems to be a trend that we've noticed for the past two, three years with using these in embedded type devices like IoT and edge devices. Um, and some of the industry verticals that we see this in are automotive, like vehicle tracking, um, aerospace, medical, railway. Um, yes. All right. So the TPM 2.0 specification comes from the TCG, which is a, an organization made up of lots of different corporate entities that help design a standard. Um, and it goes way back. Um, the 2.0 version really made it so it exposed some of the crypto primitives to make it also available as a crypto coprocessor. In addition to all the things that it's really good at, um, these are some of the algorithms that are supported on most TPMs. Some of these are optional. 
this is a comparison against three three of the modules um, and I've presented this a few times, but um, it's just showing some of the different interfaces and the algorithms, certifications, the amount of non-volatile storage space that's available. Um, and from the data sheets, I was able to get some of the power measurement numbers. Um, the great thing about the TPM specification is that it also um, defines the, the form factor for the, the actual chip which allows it to be pin compatible. All right, so now we're gonna dive into some details about Wolf DPM library and how to build it and how it's used. So currently we support, and we've tested with these five different um, vendor modules. Um, and of course, each one of these is, uh, there's new ones coming out and, and we're always working towards expanding this. Um, but these are the ones we've, we've tested with and we know work. The uh, depending on the the platform that you're building on, you, you know, you may have different interfaces to the hardware. Um, we originally wrote Wolf TPM to be used against directly against the SPI interface, which uses the the TIS, which is a transport interface specification, and it's a very small protocol for communicating to the TPM. Um, there's also some variants that allow you to use I squared C. And then since then, we've added support for using some of the Linux native dev TPM drivers. We've also added support for the Windows TBS, which is their TPM interface. And we support the TPM simulators, um, which use a, a socket-based communication uh, to communicate with a, a software-based TPM. All of the library interfaces have been abstracted to a single uh, a single callback that allows you to interface with these. And out of the box, we have support for this list of platforms. Um, we're adding them more once, more platforms all the time. So Raspberry Pi, uh, Windows STM32, the Atmel, uh, it's the ASF, the Atmel software framework. Uh, Xilinx support for their bare metal and drivers and also QNX. Uh, and then there's bare box support. So by default, the library is built as a shared library, but you can also build it as a static library, which is useful for cross compiling. We also support parameter encryption and HMAC validation, but that does require WolfScript. Uh, we have that on by default and it'll reference the library, uh, the WolfScript library with those APIs. And there is a Wolf SSL build option, which is enable Wolf TPM to turn on the required algorithms. There's a great page here that we put together that compares some of the, the TSS stacks, the, the um, IBM one and the Intel one, um, and how it compares with code size and memory use. And we're anywhere from 20 to 100 times uh, smaller um, than those. It's a, it's a great page. I recommend viewing it. Um, we also have some options to reduce the stack usage uh, for embedded targets. It's enable small stack. And it basically will reduce the, the, the buffers that are put on the stack to the, the smallest functioning size. And then we have different levels of debugging support, which can turn on additional messages. Um, and even at the byte level debugging. Uh, so if you wanted to see the actual bytes going over the, the bus, you could see that. So now we're gonna talk about some of the APIs and how to use it, how simple it is. So we implement 100% of the TCG, the TPM2 style APIs. But what we've also done is created wrappers to really simplify um, all of those things. So for example, initialization of the library, um, you know, on a native API, you would do a startup and a self-test. With the wrappers, you just call init, um, you pass, a um, context for a device and then a callback for the hardware interface uh, and an optional context. And all of the startup and initialization is hap happens automatically under the hood. Uh, also to note, all of our HAL interface examples are underneath the directory examples, tpm underscore io.c. So here's another example for creating a key um, this is, in fact, the, the storage 
root key. It's, it's an old term from the TPM 1.2. Um, basically, other keys are created off of this that can be stored into the TPM non-volatile memory. This is an example of the, the native API that's used for it and an example of the wrapper that we have. And of course, you can do ECC or RSA. You can optionally supply a password-based authentication for the created key. And then all of these also support parameter encryption, which I'll go into. So this would be an example of just creating a key that's used for signing or encryption. Um, native API would be a TPM2 create and load. And then we have a couple of wrapper APIs that do this and simplify it. So you can call a single API to create and load it into um, load it into the TPM. So traditionally what happens is you create a key on the TPM and the TPM actually gives you back an encrypted blob that only the TPM knows how to decrypt. And then you can take that and subsequently send it back to the TPM to load it and get a, a temporary handle. If you wanted to persist that key into the non-volatile, you can do this thing called evict, which basically moves it into non-volatile memory, which is always there. So this is an example of what it would look like to create and load a key. Um, so what, after you'd call the create and load key, you'll actually have a, a handle in this um, signing key that you can use for other operations. As I said before, we support parameter encryption. Uh, we support it with AES CFB or XOR. Um, let's see. So we, with the native APIs, there's a lot of code for this. Um, the wrappers really simplify it. So for example, you can just say, start a session, use, um, use let's say, AES CFB for the parameter encryption, and you want to encrypt the uh, both directions, because uh, you can optionally do just sending or receiving. Uh, the other thing it does is it turns on HMAC authentication for each of the commands. And what that does is ensures that the person who sent it is actually who it, it was from, and it can be verified using the HMAC. So this is an example of setting up an HMAC session with parameter encryption. So you can say start a session um, you know, using HMAC, and then you can say start the authenticated session. And then subsequently, you would use this, this TPM session handle for all of the, the subsequent commands, and then all of the uh, our arguments, actually only the first argument of each command, which is where the sensitive data is, gets encrypted with parameter encryption. But the, the TCG uh, group made sure that all of the those sensitive pieces are in the, the first argument of those commands or responses. So in summary, the, the native APIs provide all of the, the defined APIs from TCG. All the wrappers are ones that we defined. Um, and what we really aim to do is take the most complicated commands and um, make them simpler, the ones that are really frequently used. Um, that Those wrappers are ones that we came up with. They're not part of any standard. All right, so this is a comparison of some of the APIs comparing the native API versus the wrappers. Um, which we already went over a few of these. Um, for example, the, the create the primary key generation comparison, um, this, the key generation, which is the create HMAC generation, for example, would take 55 lines of code to do uh, an HMAC, and it's just five lines of code with the wrappers. So the TPM uses different types of authorization. Uh, most common is the password based, but you can also use handles such as the TPM session with parameter encryption. Um, this is just comparing what the native API would look like. And it's quite a bit of code to do in the native API. It's quite simple to do with the, the wrappers. So we'll talk about some real life examples. Uh, and we have, we have examples for these in our repository already. So it want to be like a secure vault, um, being able to take some data and secure it into non-volatile memory. One would be a second would be key generation. A third would be TLS type um, functionality where the long-term key uh, and even the ephemeral key is on the, the TPM. We, there's attestation examples and major boot examples. 
So uh, this is the example for, it's under the NVRAM directory and examples, and it demonstrates how to do secure storage to the NV. Um, it can take both keys, uh, asymmetric or symmetric keys, or just raw data. Um, and then you can use parameter encryption to protect that data uh, from either man in the middle or somebody who's you know snoofing the, the bus, sniffing the bus. Another one would be a key generation example. And this allows generation of uh, all the different types of keys that exist on the, the TPM. Uh, you can specify a password. Um, you can also use parameter encryption. One of the examples that's really interesting that we created was for TLS to demonstrate uh, fully using a TPM for all of the, the crypto if desired. Um, by default, we do it for all of the keys. So the long-term key, uh, the certificate, certificate generation comes from there, but we don't store the certs on the TPM, although we could. Um, but all of the ephemeral keys, um, the, the sh shared secret that's, that's generated is all comes from the TPM. And we do that through our crypto callback mechanism in WolfCrypt that allows you to register a callback function for any WolfCrypt operations when the TLS context has been set up with this set dev ID. And that's just some mapping to a, a device, some kind of numeric value that, that maps uh, to the callback function. And in there, you can actually take over what would be, let's say, uh, an ECC sign, and you can offload that to the TPM. And that's exactly what we do for uh, the TLS example. Another example is attestation. Um, for this one, we're attesting to the time on the TPM. And we had a customer who was very, uh, very concerned about the, the time. And the TPM does have a clock uh, that can be set and it is a forward only type clock. Uh, it keeps track of potentially uh, real time, but also the time since power up. It's quite interesting. Um, this example is basically attesting the time and signing it with a report that comes back that could be shared. And a lot of this is part of the, the TCG specification. There's also a measured boot example. Uh, which it lives in the Wolf Boot Examples repository, and it was for, uh, done on an STM32F4. And this demonstrates how to do well. Wolf Boot does secure boot, but this additionally uses the TPM for the verification and also for the PCRs for measuring the state and integrity of the boot process as it hands off to the application. So signing happens um, externally to the firmware image and it's transferred over the air potentially to the new device, um, to, to the uh, IoT device or whatever it is that's employing secure boot. Um, with the F4, there's two partitions set up and it's actually Wolf Boot who's responsible for verifying the, the new image and doing the swapping of it and the verification of the signature. Um, and ultimately the the hash of the image is also extended into the PCR. And by the time the secure boot process is done and the application has run, the application can go back and read the state of the PCR to ensure that it, it was correct, that it hasn't been tampered with. So uh, how much time has gone by? 20 minutes. So I could also demonstrate a few things. Uh, let me see if there are any questions yet. Looks like there is one question here. Two questions. Okay. Well, let's start with answering a couple of these. So, um, right. So, this question has to do with is it TPM 2.0 only? And the answer is yes, it's only TPM 2.0. The, the 1.2 specification is quite outdated now. Um, there's been a few asks for it, but predominantly uh, what we're finding is that the TPM 2.0 is, is the, the right progression to keep going forward. Another question is if we support the Zephyr OS. Um, 
yes, I, I, we don't have a customer using it, but yes, we support it. The reason being is that there's absolutely zero um, RTOS dependencies with Wolf DPM. So it's built strictly in C with only dependency is standard lib. There's not even any heap used. Um, and then it's up to you to employ uh, any sort of mutex protections you would want to have against concurrent access or um, the hardware interface. So yes, it's incredibly portable and we're happy to help you with that. Okay. Another question um, is, I, I, I can, uh, yeah. Another question is about storing certificates on the TPM. So there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's just some of the TPMs don't have a lot of non-volatile space and there's nothing secret in a, T, uh, in a certificate. So it's a public key that's signed. That certificate is meant to be able to be passed around in the clear um, so there, there isn't a lot of value to start in the TPM uh, besides convenience. So uh, if you have the space to store a certificate in the TPM, you can, um, but there's not really a strong benefit to it. Now, the TPMs do come provisioned from the manufacturers with uh, an endorsement key and a certificate. Um, and those basically prove you know, that this is authentic TPM. Uh, and those are available and those are always on the TPM, even through a clear process, TPM clear, which resets it. So the next question is about um, the Wolf TPM and the Windows TBS uh, as far as functionality, how they differ, right? Um, okay, so the main difference is that the TBS API interface, it, it exposes all the same commands except for the ones where you would try to store something to the non-volatile memory. Uh, that interface, because of the um, locality that it starts up as, doesn't provide the, the support for storing a key to uh, the NV, so that evict process. So you can create keys um, and you can load them into a temporary handle but you can't store them into the MV. So when we did the work to add Windows TBS support, um, that was the main thing with our examples. Some of our examples stored the key into the non-volatile just to speed up the process um, for running the tests. And so we've redone that with Windows. It just keeps a copy of that key. Uh, the key that's created is that encrypted blob. We store that in the file system and then we just reload it. Um, we just load that encrypted blob to get the temporary key handle. And that works great on Windows. Uh, otherwise, there, there isn't any other major differences that I know of. I, I, on the Windows part, because of the different locality, there are a couple other minor things um, policy-wise, which are allowed or not, but I'm not 100% clear on what those are. Okay, so uh, the next question has to do with the size of the library and if it can automatically be made as small as possible given the actual set of commands used. So my best advice there is, um, is just to use the compiler optimization to remove unused functions. So it'd be incredibly difficult to try and add if def type macros around all of the code that wouldn't be used in all cases. Um, we have done a really good job of being able to build the library without, let's say, the Wolf Crypt dependency. Um, and that does disable a few features like the HMAC support and parameter encryption. And there's a couple other minor ones. Um, and those are all set apart with macros to turn them on or off. Uh, the small stack option is not on by default. And there aren't really any effects of using that that I can tell of. Uh, so, you know, with my testing. Um, but yeah, best advice is to use the, the data section, function sections, and the, the garbage collection on the link time to remove the unused symbols. Um, that, that's really handled at link time with the compiler, though. That was a great question, though. OK, so uh, one of the things that I covered in the presentation that was a link to the comparison page. Uh, and this was put out on February 9th, pretty recently. Uh, and one of our employees, uh, Demi, who's also a maintainer of Wolf, Wolf TPM, uh, he did this very detailed analysis and comparison of Wolf TPM compared to other stacks. Um, 
And it does a really good job of showing the difference in code size and memory use. And, and granted, you know, we wrote ours from the ground up, really targeting embedded use with no dependencies. So we knew it was going to be smaller. Um, he did do quite a bit of work to make sure that he was building the other stacks as small as possible and even helped contribute a few things. Um, and, and so this is a really great uh, blog post that we did. Um, for reference, so this is our GitHub page. Um, we have lots of great documentation. Uh, they're all in Markdown and in, in README files. Uh, so one is here in the root. Another one is actually in the examples directory. There's a lot of great detail about the examples and how to use them. Um, I think the most useful thing that's outside of the library is the HAL interface examples, which are in the tpmio.c. And this provides some out of the box experiences for you know, HAL type interface examples. Um, you know, with the different chips and how they, they compare and the different platforms that you could potentially build on. Um, it, all of the, the communication occurs through an IO callback uh, that allows you to specify your own, you know, hardware interface. Uh, that callback is, could be fully customizable in your own implementation, which is why it's outside of the library proper. Um, the other thing is that, as I said before, there are not any dependencies on anything, uh, no heap, you know, no other libraries whatsoever. It's all contained within here. Another th cool thing we've done is benchmarks on each of the chips, which you will find in this README here. Uh, it's down somewhere. Yeah, benchmark results for each of the chips in here. Um, so another question was, is there a list of hardware TPM supported by the Wolf TPM? So I covered it early in the presentation, uh, but I believe it's also outlined here. Yeah, this is the complete list here of the hardware TPMs. The great thing about the library being based on a standard uh, is that they all should be, and they have been in my experience, uh, interoperable uh, with only minor differences between them. Uh, meaning, you you know, if there was a new vendor that came out with a chip, it should be supportable very, very easily, if not without any changes. So the default way we build the library, um, it's an auto detection mode. So, you know, most of the time we're building here from the command line in Linux. Uh, it, it, you can definitely build the sources directly. There aren't very many. Um, with the configure, there are some options to turn on or off. Uh, for example, if you wanted to do, you know, the Windows support or the software TPM support, um, we do have some options for specific chip vendors. Some of the things that'll happen there is it'll tune the the maximum speed of the bus. It may also reduce code size for features that aren't supported on those chips. Um, and so that's those. If you want to narrow it down, that does provide a way to do that a little bit. And this library does include its own built-in TIS layer, which is why we're able to talk over the spy bus directly. When using these other mechanisms, like let's say the built-in Linux dev TPM, uh, it bypasses our TIS layer and it goes to uh, the, the Linux driver. Same thing with the software TPM and the Windows API, because those have their own TIS layer. So, um, Right now I have like the IBM TPM simulator running here and it basically starts up a, a, a listening port, you know, a TCP server that accepts commands. And I've built with enable software TPM and then I can run the examples all the same. Um, I've also got on um, this one is an Infineon part, this one's using the, the dev spy directly. Uh, so it's not using the Linux dev TPM. Uh, you can see the vendor information gets printed out. Um, the other Pi I have here has an STM33 TPM. This one's using the, the Linux uh, dev TPM. So it's using the, the built-in Linux driver. Right. 
So it's using dev tpm0. And then when, uh, and I need sudo to access that. So when I'm running this, you can see that's against the st33. And that one over here is against the, uh, the Infineon, and this one's against the simulator. Um, there are some scripts to help with building the simulator. I believe those are in the scripts directory. Yeah, there's a this software, uh, this one right here, the software TPM sim test also provides an example for, uh, it'll set it up, it'll clone it and build it and then it'll run it for you and everything. So some of the examples that we have, uh, we have the benchmarking example. Uh, the CSR is the, basically the certificate signing request. So it'll generate a key on the TPM and, and generate a, a CSR based on that, that you could then take to a CA to have signed. Uh, and that's useful for TLS. We also have GPIO example, which is only supported on a few of the, the chips. Um, specifically right now, the ST part supports it. And that allows you to do GPIO pin control. Uh, there's the key generation example. Uh, let's see, that one's pretty interesting. And I think, yeah, so there's a key gen import and load example. Um, and this one has a couple of commands so you can specify. Uh, yeah, that's because I'm on a Mac. So it, it allows you to specify the type of key that you want to um, create. And it'll actually get back a, a key blob that has that encrypted um, key material. Uh, and then you can subsequently call key load to get a, a handle for that. Anyway, lots of examples. Um, there was also the the, um, the TLS ones. So there's an example for the TLS client and server. There's also one that demonstrates a really clean TLS client without any uh, TPM access. Anyway, I've, I've gone over 30 minutes and there are no more questions. So um, I think we'll go ahead and conclude with that. If there are any questions or follow-ups, please just send an email to fax at, uh, I know she mentioned her info earlier. Um, okay, there's one more question. But fax at Wolf SSL is, is the best one. Um, so the other uh, question is, are any TPM modules available for the Raspberry Pi? So <laughs> I, I have TPM modules for all of those um, that work with the Pi. There are a few available. Um, I think the easiest one to buy off the shelf is probably the Let's Trust, which uses the Infineon TPM. Uh, and it plugs into the, the Pi very nice. Uh, and it's a company based in Germany that, that does that. There are definitely modules that manufacturers make for the Pi. Um, but this one is probably the easiest to purchase and get. Um, and I, I'm trying to think if there are any any that are available uh, off the shelf from the vendors. I, you know, those vendors do have them. And if you're interested in uh, working with a vendor, contact them and you'll probably get one. Uh, but most of them do have a Pi uh, module available. That is a pretty common development platform. It was a great question. All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, as a reminder, this webinar is also recorded and will be made available via our YouTube channel following uh, the presentation. So please be sure to check that out. And if you would like to receive a copy of the slide deck, please send us an email at fax at wolfssl.com and we'd be happy to send that over to you. Um, otherwise, have a nice day and enjoy. Enjoy the rest of your day.